Hello. So in this video, we're going to talk about Romulus Linney's play Three Poets. I say play really kind of three short interconnected plays. Um, I think there are versions of these each of these plays that are published separately, but they are very short and, and they are kind of meant to be performed as a cycle. Um, so the first play is about Ono no Komachi, a 9th century Japanese poet. The second senti uh, po sorry, the second short play is about Rothsvita of Gendersham, a 10th century German nun and playwright slash poet. And then the third one is about Anna Akhmatova, a 20th century Soviet poet. Um, apart from the fact that they're all writers and that they all pose some sort of problem for patriarchy, um, the, the particular focuses of these three um, plays are, are rather different, and the styles of these plays are rather different. Um, the first one, uh, the play Komachi, is centered on this sort of question of love and life, the, these two sort of themes. Um, Komachi is approached by Prince Shosho, uh, who is a member of the royal household. He has fallen in love with her because of her poetry. Um, he wants to marry her, and she refuses. Um, the, the play starts... The play is written in this really interesting short verse. Let's see if I can adjust this. Yeah, so, I mean, you can't really read that very well, but you can see these are short lines here. Um, and so the play starts with these uh, poetic bits back and forth that introduce us to the theme of the poem. Kamachi opens with, in the spring, young men come running to love and kill young women. Shosho says, In the spring, young women wait like spiders to trap men. Kamachi says, Only the poet who writes about love when young, Shosho says, can write about life when old. Kamachi says, It takes one to understand the other. And then Shosho tries to sort of win Kamachi with poetry, uh, and she rewrites his verses to make them better. Um, and then we have this sort of interesting performance piece in the middle where uh, he she, she flees from him and he pursues her. Uh, he builds a bridge out of rocks. Um, he is caught in a storm. Um, his head is kicked off by his horse. Um, but then she, uh, at the end of the, the play, uh, she grows old. That is, a, uh, it's hard to tell really wh where, if at all, we sort of leave this imaginary world of the, this play within the play. Um, the Komachi becomes quite old toward the end. Um, and Shosho sort of comes back from the grave to exact his revenge. Um, so it's, it's an interesting, weird little play um, in which, again, these sort of experiences of love, life, and death are intertwined. These sort of questions of, of guilt and... what the purpose of love is. I don't know. I don't have that much more to say about it. I think it's it's an interesting play. Um, I have more to say, actually, about the, the second play on Protsvita, uh, who actually I really like. I, 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 as an undergrad, performed in a few of Protsvita's plays. Um, she is as far as I know, 
one of the first women in the Western tradition to actually write plays. Um, this So in this play, this second play, Hrothsvita, um, this monk has come on behalf of the bishop who is displeased with what's going on in the uh, in the convent at Gendersham, um, the abbess, um, da, 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 da. Gerberga, uh, assumes that what the bishop is upset about is Hrothsvita's new play that she's working on. And so the first portion of this play largely involves Rothsvita talking through this play and the characters kind of acting it out for her. Like, she can see them, and we can see them, the audience can see them, but the other two characters, Gerberga and uh, Brother William, the, the monk who has been sent here, they aren't seeing them. So this, we're seeing... Roth we're seeing the, the vision Rotsvita has of this play. It's an interesting one. Um, Rotsvita wrote devotional plays. They, these were um, very religious plays about religious subject matter, often about fallen sinners being sort of reconciled and, and brought back to God and whatnot. Um, and the, so that's what happens here. We have this... Uh, uh, this um, monk, this hermit uh, named Abraham, who is taking care of this young woman named Mary, his uh, his niece, I think. Um, and basically, he, like, he's a hermit doing his religious hermit stuff. She's basically living as a hermit, but under his um, sort of tutelage, he's, he's teaching her to be a proper religious ascetic, etc., etc. Um, Abraham has a divine vision, and when he sort of, and then he he freaks out, prays for two days, and then sleeps. And then when he wakes up, um, Mary is gone. Uh, he finds out that she has been sort of seduced by a monk, uh, and then and then is taken to a brothel where she's now working as a prostitute. So, weirdly enough, Abraham's plan to get her back is to go to the brothel pretending to be a client and basically go right up to the brink of having sex with her and then being like, haha, it's me. Come back and be a hermit again and God will forgive you, your horrible, horrible prostitution. Like, he makes out with her as part of this charade of, oh, I'm really a, a sex client. Why? It doesn't make any fucking sense, but he does it. And so, yeah, you know, and finally, then, like, she's redeemed. Um, it, so, good. Happy, happy, happy days, I guess. Um, so that's what's going on. Um, then, Brother William, who has sort of listened to this whole plot description, is like, who gives a fuck? about any of this. This is dumb little shit that no one cares about. You, Gerberga, need to stop writing and singing hymns. That's what we don't like. Women aren't allowed to sing for God. Only men. And Gerberga is like, well, you can go fuck yourself, because I, this is a free, uh, this is a free convent. I'm in charge of it, according to the king and the pope. So you can shut the fuck up and get out. Um, then Gerberga is like, Listen, Rothsvita, we're probably not going to be able to put on this play because the bishop's going to be real pissed about what just went down. Uh, but we're going to write it down. I'm going to preserve it in the archives. Yeah, it's going to be cool. Then she's like, but... Uh, can't can't have some of the stuff in there. Uh, she says here, um, and Abraham can't say out loud that he wants a woman. Change that. He just goes to get her. That's all. And that kissing. Do something about all that kissing. Ugh. Then she exits. And then, Krothsvita 
has this interesting chat with Abraham and Mary, which sort of raises these questions about where does the inspiration for a play come from? Um, Gerberga clearly assumes that Prosvita is the inspiration, that it is her idea. Prosvita almost takes a position more like um, maybe something like Luigi Pirandolo's Six Characters in Search of an Author, that what she is depicting is what happens with Abraham and Mary. That the story comes from the characters or from gods. Because um, she says here, that horrible monk called you nonsense. My mother in Christ says you mustn't kiss. They don't know who you are, and neither do I. So, Prothsvita clearly seems to be taking the position that Abraham and Mary are, are characters in themselves whose story she has to tell, as it is. But then Abraham says, we are yours which sort of aligns with what um, Gerberga had said, that, that she is the author, she is in control. But then Mary says, just as you are gods, he made you, you made us. So that's interesting, because then the question becomes, does Krotsvita have control over it, or is this some, again, sort of divine plan um, in the, the sort of Christian tradition of whatever um, can Prothsvita change these characters if the characters come from some sort of divine plan? It's an interesting problem. And then, of course, the version the version of their story that she envisions after that is much, much raunchier than the version that uh, Gerberga had nixed, because in the new version, Rotsvita has Abraham actually taking Mary to the brothel and uh, paying a lot of money for them to keep her there so he can come and have sex with her, with money that he's stealing from churches and sort of conning uh, pilgrims and whatnot out of. So that raises even further questions about truth and uh who gets to decide truth, etc., etc. In the third play, Akhmatova, um, we, we once again have these questions about the power and efficacy of art. In this case, um, we have Pektov, who is a Soviet official who's investigating a rumored poem that Anna Akhmatova is composing that he things might have revolutionary potential, like actual revolutionary potential, not like an artistic revolution or, or something. He actually thinks that this poem could inspire people to attempt to overthrow the Soviet government, particularly in the context um, that Stalin has just died, and so no one knows who's going to be the next leader of the Soviet Union or what's going to happen. Um, and so, Pektov says to, to Maria, one of the one of the multiple people that he is sort of interrogating about Akhmatova's in progress poem. He says, "In her early poems, there are always lovers. That's Akhmatova's lovers, lovers. Zdanov called her half nun, half whore. Do you know many writers like that?" Maria says, "I know many writers who would like to be like that." Pektov says. Artistic wit is so delicious when a country needs patriots. Anna Akhmatova is a relic of the Russian past, living on because of a talent, gift, yes, remarkable for writing artistic ditties. Impressive as verse, perhaps, accurate, specific, surprising, melodious in her blunt way, sticking in the mind. But what is it about? Personal superiority. That's what it's, what it's about. Nostalgia for a childhood in the city of the Tsars, and how beautiful were the pine trees, young lieutenants committing suicide, great artists, mysterious doubles, all this bunk's 
steaming in the rotten fumes of sick Christian mysticism and the stink of great art. What could be worse for a working people than a self-absorbed nun whore artiste? Are Soviet children studying her in school, today? Unthinkable. Stalin would get right out of his coffin. But I'm always ready to learn. So this idea that, like, the the personal individual dimension of Akhmatova's art somehow reflects this incredible danger to the Soviet state is really, really interesting. Um, it is, of course, a system built on collectivism, and this idea that um, her romantic or sort of ideal ideological commitment to individual experience is a potentially revolutionary existential threat to the Soviet state, I think is, is, is interesting. Um, so that's the sort of core element of that, of that play. Um, I think it's an interesting triad of plays, three poets. Um, Yeah, I don't know. They're sort of, they're short, they're, they're slightly odd, they're interesting meditations on what art can do, what art can mean, where art comes from, how art connects with other elements of life, and particularly the ways in which women's use of art is a threat to existing systems of power and authority. 